Okay. Hi everyone. Thanks a lot, and well, thanks a lot for inviting me first of all, and for the kind words in the introduction. Um, and apologies yeah, for all these technical issues. I think it's it's insane these hybrid conferences. I've been there in the, on, on the organize, or, or, or the organizing committee, and is always kind of failing for both sides, both online and, and in person. So I always, uh, yeah, not very keen on the combining both worlds, either online or in person, but yeah, we need to adapt to these changes. So yeah, moving forward, um, today I wanted to talk about uh, onto alignment for life science. That's something I've been working uh, for the past uh, years. Um, and I wanted to give you like an overview of what I've been doing. Um, a bit of my background, I'm, I've been involved in this semantic web knowledge representation community um, since 2004 when I started doing a bit of research. Um, I've been in, in several institutions, always more or less on the same domain, semantic web, KR, um, and recently moving towards uh, a bit the machine learning community as well, where I see there is a lot of potential no, in, in combining both worlds. Um, I don't think I need to explain what is an ontology to this community. I typically have some slides saying, okay, an ontology and all graph is this and that. Um, but I wanted to keep one slide at least, at least for you to understand what is an ontology for me or what is a knowledge graph for me. Because nowadays there are like different meanings for knowledge graph and, and especially some of the meanings that I don't especially like. No? We see knowledge graph mentioned everywhere, but then in the end there is just graph data. No? Um, for, for me, like a knowledge graph is pretty much an ontology um, as we have in the in the past, like a knowledge base where we have some sort of T-box and some sort of A-box. But I always uh, expect in a knowledge graph to have at least some sort of a schema or T-box saying how the data should be related to each other. Um, so this is my, my definition no? knowledge graph. When I when I mention knowledge graph, I mention what I, what I teach my students like this owl layer RDF based knowledge graph, or for short, we could say owl based uh, knowledge graph. Um, I wanted to show this as well. Um, I, I found it um, quite interesting. No? Um, I don't know if you can see it, it's very little. but then just trust me on the top, we have uh, knowledge graphs, which is it's true. There is a bit of a hype no? now. Knowledge graphs can solve everything. Um, but then, I mean, this is a bit of solid, this 2020, probably maybe there are like different graphs nowadays. But then in the same year, I found that ontologies and graphs are down there in this slope of, of this allotment. Um, in the trough of this element, no? but I think the the combination of two graphs is quite interesting, no? Because I don't think we can be knowledge graph on the top and ontologies on the bottom. Either we are in the same position, both, or because we need to stay together. So I think this means that combining two graphs, we are more in the in the next phase, no? This is a slope of enlightenment, no? Because I think for me they're equivalent. No? I don't see any difference between knowledge graph and ontologies and graphs, no? So I found it funny, no? That the same Gardner's uh, hype cycles so was putting us in two different positions at the same time. I think this is positive for the community in, in, in at least coming from KR, Semantic Web, and, and, and Life Sciences. Um, okay, moving forward uh, about onto alignment. I'm gonna use the basic definition that we use in the ontology matching community. Um, I mean, for onto alignment, we mean when we have two ontologies, two knowledge graphs, or, or several, and we would like to find links between those knowledge graphs. And a basic type of link is finding that two entities are equivalent or are they in a substantial relationship? Um, typically, we associate to uh, this kind of uh, mappings or alignments, uh, confidence value if a system created the alignment, and also we have this semantic relations. You know, there is equivalence, there is a subsumption, and possibly other uh, other relations that you can establish. Um, then, in the community, we 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 have different formats to exchange uh, mappings. We have our own RDF alignment format that is something that we use to, or at least we ask systems to produce this type of uh, format so that we can compare with the, with the gold standards and, and so on. But now in the life science community, for example, we have this SSSOM, the simple standard for, uh, for sharing ontology mappings, which is quite interesting as well, no? because the idea is not just having something very simple that represents the relationship, confidence, and, and, and that's it, but we'd like to add more provenance of who created the mappings, um, was automatically created, was manually created, and so on. We would like to add more information. And this uh, SSOM is standard as the main purpose. Another way to exchange mappings would be as an our axioms. And I think it's, this is very important no, for this presentation no, and also for my research. No, I was always assuming that 
some of the mappings could be interpreted as a, all axioms, and then this will have consequences. Um, just an idea, a basic definition of when we talk about alignment system, you give two ontologies, possibly more, and the, the system will produce an alignment among those ontologies based, in the, based on the definition we, I presented in the previous slide. Um, I'm probably not consistent in my talks or papers, but I, I wanted to add this slide saying, okay, when I talk about onto alignment, onto the matching, I mean the same. Possibly also knowledge graph alignment for me means the same. If I say match, align, or map, I also mean the, the, the same thing and so on. And sometimes I talk about mapping sets or alignment as a, as a, yeah, a set of mappings and so on. So yeah, that's just to, um, to have this cheat sheet about all the vocabulary that we're gonna be referring to, possibly meaning the same thing. Um, so yeah, one of the things I've been involved uh, as Nuria was introducing um, in, since 2011, even a bit before, just from 2011, I was more involved as a part of the organize, uh, as a participant and part of the organization, but even before I was kind of um, using the data sets. Um, and this company is quite interesting. Um, I hope that most of you at least hear about this uh, evaluation campaign we use in the Ontario Matching Community to basically have a, like a common framework to evaluate systems. And this campaign has been running since 2004, since the early stages of the Semantic Web. Um, and typically, as far as I remember, has been associated with the International Semantic Web Conference, uh, mostly driven by academia, but we have also industry uh, behind, like IBM Research, um, the Pistoia Alliance, or even Sirius has been sponsoring some of the tracks and also getting involved as part of the organizers. Um, and we believe, or as we hope, that we have been helping you know, the, the community, or at least the systems, in, in improving, having this common framework so that everyone can be evaluated on the same uh, grounds. Um, most importantly, I think we created a nice community you know, where you could talk to other developers and yeah, at least um, not working you alone, but then feeling part of, of something. No? I think that was good. Um, and overall, yeah, I think we, we, we helped improving the techniques. Um, of course, there are some challenges and limitations I will highlight later on, especially with the links of, for example, this the Ontario matching community to this community, for example, how we could improve that. Um, in terms of timing, that's something we run every year. We always we are running late with these deadlines, but ideally we should have the, uh, the data sets ready at some point in June, mid-July. Um, then system developers take the data sent into account and they, they, they prepare the systems and they submit the systems at the end of the, um, uh, the August. And then organizers evaluate um, things during September, October. Um, because in this case, now we are changing a bit, but um, in this campaign, we are system to, we, we are a participant to submit the systems and organizers need to run the system. So basically in a way that we can always guarantee that we can reproduce the results. This is getting more and more complicated because we have more and more evaluation tracks. There's a lot of work in September, October. And especially now we have like a new generation of machine learning systems, which are very hard to uh, reproduce res results locally. No? Um, either because organizers don't have the right machine um, or because yeah, we need to, uh, to invest a lot of uh, time. So things are moving a bit um, towards a way that I, we also uh, ask participants to submit some sort of source code, but eventually we, are, we will ask participants to submit the solution, not the system. Um, yeah, this open, I mean, we are a very open community. We may not look like that from outside, but yeah, we are happy to bring new organizers, new participants from any community. So if you would like to get involved, just get, get in touch, especially if you have very challenging data sets or, or, or tasks. Um, and in the evaluation campaign, we, I mean, that's the generic um, architecture where a system produces an output and then we have a, some sort of reference alignment to, to see what is expected. Sometimes it's a ground, it's a gold standard, some other times it's just a, some sort of incomplete reference. So rankings should be take, taken into account, um, to be taken carefully because sometimes it's not like a, um, we don't compare our gold standards. So it's just a reference of how good you are doing with respect to the other sometimes. Um, and yeah, to evaluate the typical metrics we use, our precision and recall, from my expertise, I'm always very interested in logical errors. I will explain later what I mean with that. And, and computational time was also important. 
So just as a, as, a, as a summary of, for example, what happened last year, there were like 18 systems participating in some of the tracks. We have 14 tracks and every track containing different matching tasks. Um, there has been like always a good interest in life science um, matching task in the campaign. And, and, and then last year we have a new biomel track, for example. Um, so just to give you an idea, like we have been having like this run, long running uh, track on, on anatomy, trying to match a very old version of the adult mouse anatomy ontology and the NCI thesaurus. Um, the good thing that the, the, the reference alignment was manually created. So it's, has been, this track has been good to, as, a, as a reference, no? because there was like a, some manual creation involved. So it has been good. Of course, it's a bit old. It's been running for more than 15 years. Um, so we, we have had since last year, uh, until, well, until last year, basically the large bio that trying to also um, generate alignment between three very large ontologies, FMA, NCI, and, and, and the SNOMED. This track was a game changer in the past because up to this, up to 2012, we, the largest ontologies were the anatomy, which in the end will host 3,000 entities. And then from 2012, we, we, move, we make like a huge step. Like we move to trying to align the SNOMED that was having, uh, back in the days, 300,000 entities. So in terms of scalability, it was like a huge impact, not to system. Um, but also in terms of uh, involving semantically rich ontologies. So we also still have, if, as far as I remember, this biodiversity that is trying to involve uh, ontologies in this domain. Um, another track that was involved in collaboration with the Pistoia Alliance in trying to align disease uh, ontologies and phenotype ontologies, um, which was also motivated by, the, by a use case uh, from industry. Um, one of the interesting things we did is like in this track, for example, we didn't have a reference alignment nor gold standard. So we, we need to compare system among each other. So what we came out is like a way of computing some sort of consensus alignment, something that most of the system voted. Of course, you need to be careful how to evaluate this, no? because you only need like a few systems to agree on a wrong mapping. Um, but I think it was all just to have a reference at least how far you were with, the, with respect to the other si systems and how far you were with respect to the mappings or alignments that were voted by most systems. So it was kind of interesting exercise. And, and also we could also see which were the alignment systems contributing on, more, or on the most of the mo voted mappings. And, and for example, we created these three vote consensus mappings for HPO and MP and also the disease ontology and ORDO. And then, yeah, we could see which were the systems contributing the most to this consensus alignment. So it was kind of interesting exercise. Um, what we did this G, uh, last year is um, basically we discontinued the large bio and phenotype uh, tracks and we created a new track called BioML, which is basically an evolution of these other two, where we try to be more friendly to the machine learning systems because we realize, okay, there are many systems out there but they were not really participating. And, but of course, we were not making things easier for them to participate, especially using a standard precision and recall and, and how we, also how we were presenting the track. So we tried to have something a bit friendlier for machine learning based systems where we have the classical evaluation where, where we get precision recall, but also we have a, another type of evaluation when we use rank based metrics like hits at K. And, and that was good. I think we, we gathered at least some subset of machine learning based systems that were out there. Um, the data sets were based on Mondo and UMLS because they already give us a reference alignment that we can use for to compare the different systems. And we evaluated that, this set of ontologies. Um, the problem on this track, as I mentioned before, is like we were not asking systems to submit the, so asking participants to submit the system but we were only required to submit the solution. It's kind of a stepping backwards a bit on the efforts on the evaluation campaign because we always wanted to be able to reproduce the results as much as possible. But then, of course, bringing this to the limit, we were not allowing many systems to participate, especially for this new track. We stepped backwards a bit and still we encourage systems to, uh, to be open source or to be available somehow, not to be able to reproduce the results. Uh, at least partially. 
And okay, that's basically the, the overview that I wanted to give about the valuation campaign and, and all the effort we did in, in life science. The next part of the of my presentation is on uh, logic-based alignment repair. That's something that has been my main focus since my PhD. Um, <clears throat> of course, I, I've been doing a bit of um, onto alignment as well. Oh, sorry. I think doing onto alignment was a bit of by chance because we my main focus originally was doing alignment repair always. So given two ontologies and, and a mapping set that was given by another system or that was available in one of the mapping repositories, trying to see if this was leading to logical errors. And then by accident, in the end, we created an alignment system as well. So of course, to do this, we were assuming that the mappings that we were given could be interpreted as all axioms. And then we could do reasoning without any extra semantics, but just using an off the shelf uh, our reasoner could really um, establish, no? You were getting some logical error or, or something that was not intended, no? From from the integration of two ontologies and and the mappings. And and here is an example, no? Of the, of the things you may encounter. This is a real example, um, at least that was in the past in UMLS. So this, uh, if you take into account the FMA ontology and the NCI ontology, and the mappings that UMLS at least was suggesting back in the days, I don't know if they have nowadays the, exactly the same problem. But at least the version I was using in 2009 contained this problem. No? And you can see, um, I think the, yeah, the green lines represent mappings, which I think are mapping things that, that look um, correct, like protein and with protein. And then you have lymphokine and therapeutic lymphokine as also equivalent mapping or entities that could be potentially equivalent. It looks fine, no? but of course, if you take into account the semantics of the input ontologies, um, there is a problem. Um, because lymphokine in FMA is, is just a protein, but then therapeutic lymphokine in NCI is, is defined as a pharmacologic substance. And then protein and pharmacologic substance in NCI are declared as disjoint. And, and that's a problem, because then you do reasoning with the two ontologies and the mappings, you will get, at the very least, in this case, two un unsatisfiable classes. Um, and this is problematic when you would like to do reasoning and then using the ontologies plus the mapping to do yeah, query answering, for example. Um, that would be a problem. And then, I mean, the problem could be, or the source of the problem could be the mappings, but in this case, they look fine. I don't know, one could argue that, okay, or it could be the, the, the ontologies have very different modeling views. You could argue that both things are the cause or at least one of them. Um, and then in the other, this case, we have these joinness actions, but in some other cases, maybe you don't have these joinness, but then by the mappings in this example between, in this case, SNOMED and NCI, what is happening is join structure is mapped to both join and set of joins in UMLS. And then this will would make is join that set on joins in FMA to be the same concept. That might be fine, but then if someone decided to keep them as different entities in FMA, it was for a reason. So maybe, from the SNOMED point of view, this is fine. But then from the FMA point of view, maybe they, you don't want these two concepts to become equivalent. So one could argue, OK, either the mappings are incorrect, or maybe yeah, the ontologies are not compatible. So yeah, we did many experiments um, on, for example, how to fix system-generated mappings, which may be a bit noisy. But we also focus on mapping repositories where you may assume the mappings are of higher quality. And also even all the standards, no? we found like a manually created mappings also were leading to, to errors. Um, and this just to give you a, an idea, no? like you don't really need to go through the whole table, but yes, the red numbers are bad. The red numbers means that the mappings that those systems generated, um, assuming them as either equivalence mappings or as all equivalent axioms or all subclass axioms, plus the ontologies doing reasoning with Hermit or Elk, we were getting so many unsatisfiable concepts. And that's insane, you know, like the number of, of classes is in some cases is almost the whole ontology. You know? So that was problematic, you know, because if you like to do something with the mappings and you get so many errors, there is little you can do. You, know? you, you like to use this in the end um, for data integration, query answering on, on other tasks. Of course, one could argue that, yeah, these systems, at least the ones with the red numbers, were not 
very precise, even though these were the, the ones with, with higher precision, but then, yeah, they still can be noisy. Um, but yeah, we did the same with UMLS uh, type of mappings and also BioPortal. Um, and the picture was was not that dramatic, but also was bad. No? In integrating the SNOMED and NCI using the UMLS mappings was also leading to more than 20,000 unsatisfiable concepts. Um, I put m possibly more because we couldn't do full reasoning with Hermit. So we use Elk, that is one of the reasoners for one of the OWL profiles. So it's an estimation no, of um, all the potential uh, unsatisfiabilities. Um, and similarly, we did for, for BioPortal. No? We also selected a subset of the ontologies and also get some, um, we got the mappings that BioPortal was, at least well, the BioPortal mappings have been evolving quite a lot. Um, this basically is a snapshot from 2014 where there were many types of mappings. Now I think there are less mappings in BioPortal. Um, but yeah, the, the picture was something similar, no? like in some cases, very high number of unsatisfiabilities. And, and even with gold standards, no? we, some of the gold standards in the evaluation campaign that were manually created, by doing reasoning, we identified that there were some, not logical errors, but at least some unintended consequences. And this, this one was quite funny, no? that because the way the different the ontologies were modeled and how the main and ranges actions were used in the input ontologies, in the end, you have something like a technical report in one, uh, was uh, subsumed by, by date in the other ontology. No? So it was something wrong happening there. No? And, and then we reported this to the, to the evaluation campaign. Like, look, if we have a gold standard, we, we should avoid this type of uh, errors no? in, in, in alignment. Um, but yeah, I mean, already mentioned in the previous slides uh, that there are different sources or, or ways to blame no? who is causing these uh, unintended consequences no? when using reasoning. Um, so one option could be, well, first of all, you need to, uh, to detect the problem. Um, but then once you detect the problem, you need to say, OK, am I, am I blaming the mappings? Maybe you need to modify the ontologies because I don't know, they were too strict at defining the joiners. Or at the very least, you should be aware that a combination of mappings may cause errors. That is something we did in, in one of the, um, of the works. No, we were pointing to the errors in BioPortal, but then in some cases we assume that you don't want to do reasoning or maybe those, some mappings cannot be interpreted as an OWL equivalences. Okay, that's fine. But at least we wanted to, the users to be aware, okay, if you use this set of mappings and then you interpret them as an OWL, don't tell, as an OWL axioms, there might be problems, just to be aware. No? We wanted to basically annotate a set of mappings as conflicting no? if they were together. Because maybe you were not interested in doing reasoning and just maybe annotating data sources, no? and it could be the case. Um, what I've been doing in the, in the past is blaming the mappings. Okay, I don't want to blame the ontologies. Someone created ontologies and assume that are good. But then the mappings is the easiest thing to, to, to blame, especially the mappings have been computed by a system. So we define coherent set of mappings, those causing an unsatisfiable class. Basically, the union of the input ontologies were uh, fine, but then by adding the mappings and performing reasoning with input ontologies and mappings, we get unsatisfiable concepts. And then we define mapping repair as a subset of mappings where if we remove them from, from the original mapping set, then the, the, the resulting subset of mappings is coherent. Of course, we could remove all the mappings, and by definition, the empty set is coherent. Um, but of course, we would like to do a bit better. We would like to create something, ideally a diagnosis, that would be the, a minimal repair plan, such that we remove this set of mapping and, and everything is good. Of course, diagnoses are hard to, to obtain. Um, so, so diagnosis typically involve full reasoning and st standard justification base onto the debugging when we extract like the, the reason by, by why we get an entailment, which is also quite computationally hard. Um, but the key is always, of course, when using full reasoning and maybe getting the diagnosis is very expensive, the key is trying to find something approximate, something that is good enough at least to fix, if not all the errors, most of the, of the errors. And then maybe as a final step, you can try to use full reasoning when then when the number of problems are are reduced. Um, 
and it's something we face in the past. No, we're trying to be as complete as possible. No, using full reasoning, using these um, justification-based repairs, and we realized that was actually very expensive even for small ontologies. So we need to find something that is. I mean, it wasn't at that end, but it was more like okay, okay we know which are the limits. Now try we need to try to make it um, easier and, and not um, that expensive computationally. So we. I mean, after this work that we did in the past, we're trying to push the limits a bit more, or at least how it, it, a standard or off the shelf reasoners of how we're able to identify the errors. Because for FMA, NCI, for example, FMA is SNOMED, that are quite large, this was possible, but then they were struggling with the SNOMED NCI. So that was one of the limitations also, not only even, even before trying to solve the problem, trying to identify the errors was um, challenging. Um, and we also be evaluated, okay, we, once we are able to identify the errors, can we extract justifications and then trying to use them to fix? And then, yeah, getting justifications was very expensive as well. Um, of course, there are tricks. You, you try to get all possible justifications is very, very, very expensive, even for small ontologies. But you can't get only one justification, 10 justifications, and then use this use for the repair. It's not going to be complete. But then after several iterations, you will find uh, a solution. The problem is still, by using only extracting only one or 10 justifications, it can be very expensive if the number of errors is also large. Because maybe extracting one or 10 takes a few seconds, but then when you have 20,000 unsatisfiabilities, it's going to be quite expensive. Of course, your algorithm could be smart enough not to, and maybe it doesn't need to extract justification over the 20,000 just uh, unsatisfiabilities. But worst case scenario could be the case. So we, we realized that in practice, we need something that was more scalable, at least for very large ontologies. And that's why we started working in this lockmap system, which was originally a repair system, and by accident, ended up being also a mapping and matching system. Five, five minutes. OK. Um, so yeah. Oh, OK, we are hoping a bit more <laughs> for the third part. Um, so I'm going to skim through this as quick as possible because I would like to say a bit more on the final part of the presentation. Um, so basically, this system is using horn proportional logic instead of owl. So basically, it gets owls as an input, but projects to horn proportional. And then reasoning gets very quick there. So we, we can use one of the SAT solvers that they were off the shelf, which identify unsatisfiability was quite quick. And also the Downing and Gallier was very nice at tracking which paths were involved in the unsatisfiability. So it was also giving us almost for free a potential justification almost for free as well. So it was very good. Um, so Logmas in the end implements a very, I would call it greedy, but in the end it's kind of smart, but then very simple um, repair for individual classes and finally a global repair. And then the repair we created, they can guarantee that is perfect for the horn propositional case. Um, of course, we cannot guarantee that it's perfect for the owl case, no? um, because we are projecting everything into, into owl. So we couldn't guarantee that then using reasoning in owl was leading to no error. Um, but in practice, what we realized is like the picture was very good. So we started with, with we have the red numbers, and then the final column is what Lockma was doing, no? Like we were able to repair most of the errors, and then there were only nine remaining, no? Because of course we are not, we are not full. In some other cases we were able to clean all the errors, but in this case there were nine left. And then once you have only nine errors, you you could potentially use full reasoning, justification-based techniques, and fix this even manually. So then I wanted to <laughs> talk a bit about possibly the more interesting part part of the presentation. Um, hopefully you can give me a few minutes more. <laughs> Um, that's what I've been doing more recently about machine learning um, for onto alignment, where the idea was to, to mix both worlds, no? like trying to apply more like data-driven methods with knowledge-driven methods no? from, yeah, from the KR representative, from the semantic web and KR communities. Um, and then, yeah, you're not aware of this paper. I find it quite interesting. They have even a, a new paper also that they, they, they try to describe the different patterns. And one of the patterns is where you get some symbolic representation and you transform this symbolic representation into vectors, which is 
very interesting, no? because this kind of transformation will try to preserve as much as possible the semantics of the symbolic representations. So we have been working on, on this case where we, we have an owl ontology and we wanted to extract vectors from, for the entities in, the, in this owl ontology. Um, when you do a little bit of literature review on knowledge graph embeddings, typically you find the, 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 the three first columns. Um, but I will also add a, a fourth column where there are like these language-based models as well. Um, and that's very important because, um, especially always I have, on, I, at least in the past and, and in a bit now, onto alignment in mind. And to, and to do onto alignment, you need the, the structure of the ontology, obviously, the semantics, the axioms, but the lexical information is going to be key. So I realized that all knowledge graph embedding approaches was kind of disregarding the lexical information, and which is critical for onto alignment. So we basically inspired by this other version, rdf 2 vec which is great. We created our own system, owl 2 vec that was taking into account the owl actions, more or less, and also the lexical information in the owl ontology. And because always in my mind was um, using this for onto alignment. Um, so yeah, but quickly on, on how to bake, we basically projected the ontologies into a graph. We were working the graph basically as RDF to bake, creating a corpus of sentences. Um, then those sentences, we were having the keys in, in, on those sentences. We were not having only URIs as RDF to bake, for example, but we were also mixing um, lexical information and URIs. So in the end, we were having three different documents, um, one with sentences with only URIs, another set of sentences with only lexical information, and then a document mixing everything, URIs and, and words. Um, I mean, the model we were using is word to back. I mean, now one could argue that we could use um, other language models, and indeed, that's something we, we, we are doing. But the good thing of, of, of using word to back in this scenario is like we were getting vectors for both words and URIs, and it was quite Interesting to then to use these, those vectors in another subsequent machine learning task. Um, so, for example, here we were using, we have the concept blonde beer from Fudon, and we were getting a vector for the URI, but also a vector for each of the words like blonde and, and beer. And, and finally, we got, you know, after a few years um, uh, working on the idea, we, we end up applying this to onto alignment, you know, trying to combine LockMap and possibly other systems in the architecture without out to vec machine learning uh, step on what we call log ML. And then they will, it is leading to interesting results. Still, well, premature results, but there's something we hope that uh, can be improved. Um, another thing, and I think I stop here, um, but I think it's worth mentioning, because it can have some application to onto alignment as well. We didn't get there yet, but the idea was trying to see how pre-trained language models, like in this case, we were evaluating Roberta, can kind of capture the, 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 the semantics of an ontology, no? if they capture subsumption, not only atomic, atomic subsumption, but also uh, complex uh, subsumption. No? And, and basically in this, in this study, we serialized ontology into, well, verbalized, sorry, into something that we could give to, to Roberta, and we were creating some, some prompts, and then we checked like how, in this case, Roberta was behaving. Um, and the, the problem in the end was reduced to this natural inference uh, problem. And the results are quite interesting. I mean, on the zero short case where we are not giving any, any samples, the results are, are not good. But as soon as we give some, some samples for true and false cases, um, the results uh, grow quite quickly. So this means like the language model in this case, Roberta, is kind of already encoding a bit of the the semantics of, of the ontologies, no? and we tested different ontologies. So it's, it's quite promising. On the, in the digital shot case, I think we behave much more than the, top, the typical or standard uh, natural language inference case. But then once we give some samples, I think the performance is growing. And, and then in the future, we, we would like to also use other models like ChatGPT. And then th that, this is something that can be also applied to onto alignment because we could try to see, now the, the experiments were only in ontology, but then one could think how to create, or either use the same prompts or create focused prompts to do inter-ontology alignment. 
And I think there is some potential. And because again, for onto alignment, the semantics are very important, but lexical information, I think is also, also key, no? And then possibly combine both walls, no? See what language models can give us for free and then trying to use our more kind of semantic web-like techniques no? to guarantee that everything is semantically correct. Um, yeah, if you'd like to know more, I can talk later more um, during the coffee break about the verbalizer. Um, I'm going to skip this learning because we, we, we apply also knowledge graph embeddings um, for ecotoxicology. I can give you more details in the coffee breaks where we're trying to predict you know, which chemicals were affecting which species, which can be seen as some sort of alignment you know, across um, two different knowledge graphs. And, and that's everything. Um, just to conclude, um, I mean, the, we were having facing different challenges in the ontology matching community, which, with, I mean, large ontology was a challenge. I don't think it's anymore. Um, the use of background knowledge. Still, I think there is a bit of a challenge coping with these logical errors and guarantee that the, the output is at least not without any, not many logical errors. Usually involvement is something that may help in introducing onto alignment at least more in, um, in real world cases. What definitely we need more, more work is in bringing more machine learning uh, at least to the community and, and also going way beyond uh, equi atomic equivalence or subsumption. Another thing, like it's also, I'm ha quite happy to be here, you know, in this workshop with uh, with another community, is how to get a better connection with real world cases, you no? Know? And I think this um, biontology's interest group could be very relevant to, you know, bring new use cases to the ontology matching e evaluation campaign. Um, since this is an interest group, if someone is interested, or and especially you are based in UK, we have an interest group on knowledge graphs, so we could find some synergies about both interest groups. And yeah, that's that's everything I wanted to tell more or less. Was skimming a bit fast on on the ecotox use case, but I think I I said most of the what I wanted to say. So yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Ernesto, for a great, fantastic talk. Um, there is a question from the audience here in person. Um, have you considered um, using other existing bioontologies, smaller ones? Um, for example, I work on the SEO, uh, sickle cell disease ontology, and we haven't really gone the conventional route of reusing large chunks of other ontologies. We've kind of really picked and, you know, uh, chosen exactly what we want, but then being very careful about how we put those together and really looking at the ontologies that we're taking them from. Um, do you think ontologies, smaller ontologies that have done that, and I mean, you know, I've noticed that, yes, there are things that are incorrect, uh, you know, ontology, other terms in other ontologies, big ontologies that are mapping to other things that are not, uh, you know, it's not, not correct. Um, and perhaps using ontologies like that, like you, we have obviously uh, got our own method of then uh, showing, uh, you know, the sources of each term that we've reused. Um, and perhaps you could make use of that to help your system. I don't know. Hmm. The, yeah, I think that, yeah, you start your question, right? I think in, in the past we have been taking this use case into account, no? where you have a smaller ontology, and you would like to reuse from bigger ontologies, but possibly you are not. You don't want to reuse everything from a SNOMED, but you would like to reuse a fragment. Um, and indeed, there was a case where they were manually getting entities from a SNOMED. I mean, the, uh, luckily the small ontology wasn't too large, you know. But there was something that possibly with ontological alignment could have helped a lot the process. Then what we also work in in the community is in extracting modules according to a set of entities, which is the minimum, but not minimal, but the, the, the subset of the ontology that describes the entities you're interested in. You are only interested in 10 entities from a SNOMED. You don't want to import the whole SNOMED. So how could you can import only a fragment of the SNOMED for the 10 entities that may help describing your ontology? So that's something that we, we have been playing around and I think it's important, no? like when we re also part of reuse, 
And when you do alignment, I think you, you may want to reduce from a bigger ontology or set of bigger ontologies. Um, then, yeah, annotation that can be found in, in ontologies. That's something we reduce, for example, we are taking into account Mondo that give us kind of links. And we are using this as a, as a reference. So we assume the system cannot, cannot get Mondo, no? because if you get Mondo, of course, you, you will get a perfect alignment. Or if you use UMLS. So but we use uh, Mondo that has been uh, manually created and also UMLS to give a reference alignment. And then you could potentially use this. Um, we use it as an evaluation. But then, of course, in a real world scenario, you could reuse this uh, for training no? as well. Um, and then you are presented with other cases. No? You could try to cope with that. I don't know if you am, I am sorry, you, I think you were kind of two questions, no? And I don't know if you might miss anything from, from your questions. 